Well, good morning, every person. It's uh, great to see you all here this morning. Let's, let's, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do again thank you for your word. It is uh, precious and it is powerful, and we pray that you would help us to understand what it is that you have said here and, and, and what it means and who Jesus is. We pray that in all of it, you would help us to understand and embrace and submit to your word. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes in life, you can look back on things, back on events, moments with a, a special kind of clarity that you wish you had have had at the time, you know, hindsight. In looking backwards, we often see things more clearly than when we're in the present. And because with hindsight, you can see the circumstance from more angles, you can better see the cause and the effect, you, you have more clarity. And sometimes when you look back like that with hindsight, you can think to yourself, what a waste, what a wasted moment, what a wasted opportunity. I don't think I would be um, over dating the case to say that every person, everyone in this room looks back at certain moments, certain events with some level of regret about what had happened or what didn't happen. I mean, how many of us look back at photos of ourselves from, say, 10 years ago and don't sometimes think, you know, I, I regret that haircut or I'm not sure those shoulder pads were a good idea, <laughs> or surely those glasses could have been bigger. You know, we all, <laughs> you look back sometimes or, or you see, you know, pictures of your parents and you just think, well, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what they were doing. Often we look back on things that we've said or things that we've done with regret. We said things that we shouldn't have said. We didn't say things that we wish we'd said. Back in 2008, I was uh, flying back from Queensland. We'd, we were up there to see Nicole's um, sister and I had to come back early for some reason and she kind of was there for a few more um, days than me. But I came back early and I was in the airport and I was bored and I think about this, no joke, at, at least every six months. I was in the airport and I was bored and I didn't want to buy a book or anything. I didn't really have much space. So I bought a newspaper, which I don't normally do and haven't, I don't think, done since. But I bought one and I, I read it in the airport. I read it on the plane. And so I'm on the plane, right, in my seat. And I had finished reading and the pocket of the seat in front of me was full of stuff and I didn't have, it, have anywhere to put it. So I folded it up and I sat on it. That's important. So I, I'm there, I'm sitting on it. A few moments pass and the woman next to me turns to me and says, are you finished with that? Just to remind you, I'm sitting on it. Are you finished with that? And I, I look back on that, there's so many things that I wish I could have said, you know? Like at the time I had thoughts, but I didn't say them. I was too chicken. I just said, yep, if you'd like it, here, here, here you go. But what I wanted to say, and I think about this a lot, I'm not gonna lie. What I wish I had have said was, I'm just finishing the crossword. <laughs> but you can have it once I'm done. <laughs> and I think about that at least every six months. That's one of the biggest regrets in my life that I chickened out and didn't, like, I didn't know this. I was not never gonna see her again. I could have just said it, <laughs> but I didn't. And I reg every day I live with that. You know, you think back sometimes and you just think, what a waste, right? It's, been, it's like 15 years on. And I still think about that. What a waste. 
And a lot of us have moments where we look back and we wish we'd said things or wish we'd done things and we think, what a waste. Don't tell any of my uh, teachers this, but I wish I could go back and do school again because I reckon I, if I could just do it with what I know now, I w it'd be so good, but I, I wasted it. It was such a waste and I wish I could go and do it again. I mean, I didn't read any English book in my entire school career, none of them. And I think back, oh, I wish I had, if I knew now, I'd go back and I'd have a great time. But we've got things that we think, you know, what a waste. Painful regrets, painful errors, mistakes. When we look back, things that we wish we could change, you'd think like telling someone how we really felt about them before it was too late, maybe having an argument and saying different things or not saying anything at all that would have gone differently. We've got things that we regret and we look back and think, what a, what a waste. But often it's when you look backwards, you can see things with more clarity than when you're in the moment. And it's the same with life. It's the same with Jesus. Maybe you're here and when you were, you know, back in your younger days, that you, you wrote Jesus off and you didn't think about him and church things, you just kind of waved them off. And it was only later in life that you sort of rethought and re-looked and maybe you're here and you're still rethinking, re-looking at Jesus and you haven't quite worked out what you think. Maybe you're here and you've been following Jesus for ages, but you feel like you wasted a lot of time early on. And if you could go back, you would do some things differently. Maybe you're here even, and perhaps you've been following Jesus for ages. Maybe you've been at least coming to church for ages, but it sort of feels like, if you're honest, that it's been a bit of a waste and maybe things haven't turned out the way that you thought they would or things haven't gone the way that you hoped they'd go. And maybe it feels like following Jesus has been a bit of a waste. And what we're gonna see in our passage this morning is a bunch of people who sort of saw Jesus up close and kind of wasted it. They, these people were there with Jesus himself and sort of felt like he wasn't what they were looking for. And what I'm hoping is that we'll see what they missed. Hopefully, we'll see what they should have seen. And hopefully, as we look at them, it'll help us to not waste the things that we've seen. It'll help us not to walk away from Jesus. And perhaps even it'll help us to get clear on who Jesus is, maybe even for the first time. And it'll help us to put our trust in him. So we're in Luke chapter four, and it is a fairly confusing, confronting passage. I don't know as it was being read out. There's things in there that are confusing and it's pretty, it gets pretty hectic. And what Luke wants to show us here is a key moment in Jesus' ministry and his life he wants to point out this bit specifically, because if we can get this bit, then we'll understand the whole thing. If we can understand this piece, then we'll understand Jesus' life and his ministry as a whole. Because what we're going to see is who Jesus is, what that means, and then how people respond. So let's, uh, let's jump in. Luke chapter 4 from verse 14 says, then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. Okay, so if you were here last week, Jesus was down south in the Jordan area. Now he's back up north in the region of Galilee. And he's teaching in their synagogues, kind of like the Jewish version of church. He's teaching and news about him is spreading everywhere. Everyone is praising him. It's a real 
powerful, positive, impressive start. And Luke does not want to focus on that. Instead, he wants us to zoom in on a different specific moment. So verse 16 says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus is reading here from Isaiah chapter 61 from the Old Testament, written hundreds, hundreds of years before Jesus arrived on the scene. And in this part of Isaiah, the prophet is looking forward to the future. What would it be like when God finally intervened in history? What would it be like when God finally made everything right? Because pretty much from when Isaiah wrote his book onwards, Israel, hundreds and hundreds of years, things had not been going well. They were constantly at war, constantly being conquered, being oppressed. They were never on top. They were always at the bottom of the heap. And Isaiah looked forward to a time where God would change all of that, where everything would get reversed, where he was promising a time would come where there'd be no more violence, no more war, no more oppression. Israel would be the capital city of the world, There'd be no people oppressing them. Those who were oppressing them would be serving them. And Israel would finally, finally, Israel would be number one. And God was going to do it all through a person, the anointed one. The Hebrew word for anointed one is Messiah. And the Greek word is Christ. And when this person, this anointed one, showed up, it was going to be good news, good news for the poor and the captives and the blind and the oppressed. And that's like a picture of what Israel was like on the world platform, right? They were poor, captive, blind and oppressed. But when this promised one comes, all of that's going to be reversed. It's going to be good news. And for hundreds of years, Israel had been waiting for God to finally send this promised one. And so Jesus finds the passage in the scroll, Isaiah 61, and he reads it out. And then it says, verse 20, he then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down which is what you would do when you're about to teach, right? Not like our church where you stand up the front at the, whatever this is called, the microphone, lectern, not like that. You would go and sit in the special kind of teaching chair. So he goes and he sits and then it says, verse 20 again, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, right? You can feel the tension. Verse 21, he began by saying to them, today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And it's a real rock star moment, right? You can just imagine being there in that room. He reads that bit, these promises, pauses for dramatic effect. Everyone's eyes are on him. And then he's like, all of this, that's me. Boom, this guy, you're welcome. And the place is pretty excited. Verse 22, they were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? Right, they're amazed. They're amazed at him. They're amazed at the words that he's spoken. They speak well of him. And then it says at the end there, yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? And it sounds a bit like they're, they're sort of withdrawing. They were very excited. And then they're like, hang on a minute. Isn't, isn't this Joseph's 
Son, we know this guy. You used to look after him when he was a kid. We, we know him. This can't be... And it, it feels like they're sort of undercutting their enthusiasm. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is they're getting even more excited. They're joining some more dots. They're like, he's our guy. He's from around here. He's our guy. You know, like the headline in the local paper, local carpenter makes it big. It's that kind of thing. It's, he's, our, he's our guy. He's our local guy. And they all get very, very excited, even more excited, even more enthusiastic. They're like, the Messiah is our guy. He's God's king and he's from our town. He's going to go to the top and we'll get to go with him. If we play our cards right, he can take us to the top. We know him. Because they're thinking political. They're thinking military. They're thinking economic. They think Jesus is going to be a king like every other king. He's going to be a military king, a political king. He's going to be rich. And the Roman oppression will stop because he's going to conquer them. And they won't oppress us anymore. We'll oppress them. Jesus is going to kick some Roman heads in. We'll all get to flick a ball of snot at them. It's going to be great. And if we play our cards right, we can be power players too. And Jesus is like, you've got the whole thing wrong. You don't have the first clue what's going on and who I am. So we've got kind of question one almost answered. Who is Jesus? Well, the answer is he's the king. He's the Isaiah 61 anointed one who's going to reverse everything and fulfill all of God's promises. But the next question is, what does that mean? And they've already been a bit kind of struggling to work that out. What does it mean? The people don't understand. And so Jesus is going to explain it to them. And he says two things to them that are sort of one thing. So the first thing he says is verse 23. It says, then he said to them, no doubt you'll quote this proverb to me. Doctor, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. The phrase, doctor, heal yourself, is often used to mock someone for being a bit of a hypocrite. You know, it's like when you get laser eye surgery from a surgeon who wears glasses and you think, well, that's odd. Or like, you know, when your personal trainer's not real fit and you're like, oh, that's weird, you know. Doctor, heal yourself. You know, it's like that kind of thing. Why don't you do for yourself what you are trying to do for me? But that's not how it's being used here. The vibe here is more like healing starts at home. You know, do great things here. Before you go do great things everywhere else, do it here. Look out for your own. Heal yourself. That kind of idea. He says, now I know that you're thinking that because I'm from around here, that's going to mean some kind of advantage for you. I know that you think maybe some kind of physical, economic, maybe political advantage, if we can just ride, you know, hook our wagon to him, we can ride this gravy train all the way to the top. I know you're thinking about that. But he says, you don't know where I'm going. He says, I'm not, I'm not going to a palace. I'm not going to wine and dine with kings and queens. I'm going to a cross and a tomb to be treated like an animal. That's where I'm going. You don't understand. But he says, it's, it's even more than that. He says, verse 24, he also said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Which is an odd thing for him to have said because they accepted him. They were very enthusiastic, actually. You know, news had spread about him throughout the whole region. Everybody's praising him. They spoke well of him. They're amazed at his words of grace. It all sounds pretty accepting. They've accepted him. But he says no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And what he means is, you all only accept me 
because you've just made up a fantasy of what you think I am. You only accept me because you don't actually know me. You've just invented what you think I should be and what you think I'm on about. You've made up your own like mirage of who I am and you love that guy that you've invented, but you don't actually love me. You, you don't want the real me. You want the other guy. And when you find out, he says, when you find out what I'm really on about and, and what fulfilling these promises really means, you're not going to accept me at all. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. And when it looks like they're accepting him, it's because they don't really know him. They're not really accepting him. And so Jesus helps him to understand what he's on about. And he, he uses two examples from Israel's history in verses 25, 26, 27. One of them is from the great prophet Elijah, and the other one is from the even greater prophet Elisha. And in both examples that Jesus brings up, the people that were helped were non-Israelites, right? Not Israel. So during Elijah's time, there was this massive famine, drought, because um, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel had brought Baal worship into Israel. And so there was no rain, no food. But Elijah miraculously provided food and oil and even raised this widow's son from the dead. And this widow was not from Israel. She was from Sidon, which is where Queen Jezebel was from. Non-Israelite. And then Elisha, he healed Naaman, the non-Israelite, of his leprosy. There was heaps of lepers in Israel, but Elisha healed the non-Israelite, Naaman. And so both Elijah and Elisha did these great miraculous works, but for Gentiles, not for Israel. And Jesus is explaining in pretty provocative, pretty explosive, pretty confrontational way, he's explaining he hasn't come for the advantage of his hometown. He's, there's no mates rates happening here. And he hasn't even come to privilege Israel against the rest of the world. Right, the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. In Jesus' mind, that's not just Israel. That's the whole world. And Jesus has come to do more than just conquer the Romans and enrich his hometown. He's come to bring real freedom from the things that really oppress us. Things like sin and its consequences. Things like death and the evil spiritual forces. He's come to, to free us from them, the real oppressors. That's who Jesus came to conquer. And so who is Jesus? Well, he's God's spirit-empowered, anointed Messiah. He's come to reverse it all and fulfill God's promises. But what does that mean? Well, he also tells his hometown They've only accepted him because they want him to be someone and be something that he's not. They want him to be a political, economic, military messiah. And they want him to be someone they can hitch their wagon to and ride all the way to Gravy Town. And he tells them he hasn't come to advantage and privilege and prosper them. He's come to do something bigger. And he's come to do it for people outside the camp, maybe even people that they don't like. And so then how do they respond? Well, verse 28, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town and brought him to the edge of the hill that their, that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But, they, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. We're not quite told exactly how he slipped through this crowd. Luke is not interested in that. But the people absolutely lose their trolley, right? He tells them 
I'm not just going to help you. I'm not just about Israel. I'm about the whole world. And they are enraged and they try and murder him. And this is what Luke wants us to see. This is why Luke zooms in on this bit and not any of those other moments. Because if we can understand this bit, then we'll understand the whole thing. If we can understand this part, then we'll understand Jesus. We'll understand what happens to him. We'll understand how people respond to him. Because this, the shape of this episode is the shape of Jesus' entire ministry. People are going to like him so long as he does the miracles. As long as he heals us when we're sick. As long as he feeds us when we're hungry. As long as he does it for the right people. As long as he does it for our team, then he's welcome to hang around. But as soon as the miracles start to dry up, as soon as he starts doing them from the, for the wrong people, then we're going to start to have problems. And he better not try and teach us anything. Just do the miracles, give us the bread, and then you're welcome. Because if any of that other stuff starts happening, then he'll need to go. We'll need to get rid of him. That's the shape of it. That's how Jesus ends up on the cross. Everyone wants Jesus to join their team. And it was the same back then and it's the same now. Everyone just wants Jesus on their team. Whether it's team Nazareth or team Israel or team Pharisee, or whether it's Team Australia, or Team Anglican, or Team Pitt Town, or Team Hawkesbury, or Team Rivo, or Team Craig. Everyone wants Jesus on their team. And it's the same now as it was then. Jesus isn't joining anyone's team, but Jesus invites everyone to join his team. And those two things are totally different. You can still be Australian, of course. You can still be Anglican if you want. You can still be Craig or whoever you are. But don't think that Jesus is joining your team. He calls on you to join his team. And people respond now like they did then. Sometimes not as extreme, but still the same basic shape. You know, some people kind of like... Jesus, when he just provides stuff, but don't, don't teach me anything. Others wouldn't mind Jesus being on their team, as long as they get to still be team captain, as long as he agrees with what I reckon. Some people like to have Jesus around, so long as he keeps answering the prayers in a timely fashion. Some people want Jesus around so long as he comes to advantage and privilege and prosper them. But he didn't, and he hasn't, and he won't. Jesus didn't turn up just to provide me stuff, answer prayers, do miracles, give me things. He didn't turn up to agree with me. He didn't turn up just to join my team. Jesus turned up to do so much more than just conquer the Romans and advantage and enrich his hometown. He came to bring real freedom from the things that really oppress us, sin and its consequences, death and the evil spiritual forces. They're the real enemies. They're the real oppressors. They're who Jesus came to conquer. So who is... Jesus, well, he is God's spirit-empowered anointed one, Messiah, who has come to reverse all the things and fulfill all God's promises. And he calls on us, all of us, to accept him for who he is, not who we would like him to be. And so the question is, will you follow him or do you just want him to join your team? Because if you walk away from him, then that would be an absolute waste.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus and that he is who he is. And Father, we do thank you for his work, not just to advantage his hometown, not just to advantage just Israel, but for all of us, the whole world. And Father, we do pray for each one of us in this room, wherever we are with him. Father, we pray that you would help us to continue to put our trust in him, not expecting Jesus to join our team and agree with us on all the things, but that we would be joining his team. And you'd help each one of us to follow him, not just for what he gives us, but that we would follow him for who he is. And Father, we pray that in his name. Amen.